Hello, good afternoon to you and welcome to our special coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Vivian Kailo, who will bring you up to date on all that is happening around this pandemic, the latest to it and all that. In a bit, I'll introduce to you my panel for this afternoon. My name is Vivian Kailo, who stay with us. We'll be right back. So you're welcome back to a special coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me introduce to you my panel for today. I have with me Godfrey Akoto Boafo. He's Yay! the head of Current Affairs. He also hosts Face to Face. He's also on the City Breakfast Show. Another corporate on the City Breakfast Show is Kojo Akoto Boafo. So you're doing a double dose yes, of Akoto. A double dose of uh, Akoto and a double dose of and, host and on the corporates. Breakfast Show. And a double dose what of corporate. Corporates. <laughs> We have Kojo Akoto Boatin, he's also the head of research, also head of new media, and is with the City Breakfast Show on radio. Gentlemen, welcome to today's coverage you, of Vivian. the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, luckily for us today, there have not been any new cases recorded. In fact, the cases that were uh, tested over some period, we're told all are negative. So I don't know whether I'll let uh, Kojo run us through the latest on that using the city um, newsroom.com um, graph to give us the latest on this uh, pandemic. So at the moment, we, we are at yesterday's figures, if I can put it that way. The last update on COVID-19, the Ghana picture, was yesterday around uh, midday. Um, then we're told that we, so far we have 152 cumulative cases yeah. and we have five deaths, two recoveries and so our active cases at the moment are 145 okay. in Ghana. That's where we are now. Now yesterday we also got to know about the 10 Guineans mm -hmm. who tested positive, positive for COVID-19 yeah. who are going to be repatriated and we've also, also been told about how testing is going to be done going forward. So. Now things are becoming a bit more clearer. We know the way forward. Today the lockdown has begun. We've been told that testing is going to be a bit more rigorous. We are going to test more people in mandatory quarantine. We are going to test more people through the tracing. And then we are going to test all the people in the lockdown areas. Yes, that's right. That's, that's what we understand. Okay. So, Godfrey, with that, the testing, 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 which has become the big mm -hmm. thing now, a great move it is, but uh, is it possible looking at what we have as a country in terms of resources and all that? Yeah, it has to become plausible, Vivian. If you look at the situations globally, the best examples we have seen are those who have found ways of doing the testing. Mm -hmm. Now, what I appreciate about the Ghanaian circumstances is the fact that there's a certain nuance to it. We, we know the popular acclaim is everybody should be tested. Yeah. Why don't you test everybody? Yeah. But if you listen to the experts in the space, they'll tell you that you can test a thousand and you might get ten. That's a waste of resources. Mm -hmm. So until you show certain symptoms. Now, the best, the next best thing to do is to test those who have come up as part of the surveillance and the contact testing because at least those ones you are guaranteed they have been in the same space, geographical Around space, as persons with confirmed cases. Mm -hmm. And so there's a likelihood. And if you look at the percentages we have seen so far, mm -hmm. it looks like once that happens, you, are, you have close to a 40 to 50 percent chance of getting a positive test with those persons. So at least we know that the resources are going in the proper direction. Once we're able to do that, we know whether they fall into the category of the mild, the moderate, the severe, and the critical, and then we treat it that way. Mm -hmm. So for me, the upscale in testing by the government and the way in which it's been done, I think is the way to go. So far as the contact tracing, and for me, that is where the crucial bit is, and I was happy to hear the information minister insist on Ghanaians providing accurate and truthful information, mm -hmm. because without accurate and truthful information, 
this is going to go waste. Yeah. Because then you might say, oh, I was at A, but you weren't actually there, I was with B, but you mm -hmm. actually weren't with B. Mm -hmm. They might go to that person and waste the test kits. And even disclosures, <laughs> whether exactly. you are around people, because we've seen cases over the period where exactly. people were around people who had come in, imported and, say and never yeah. said anything. Exactly. So it is important that people are very accurate with the disclosures that they make regarding this. That is the only way the testing path that we have chosen now will succeed because whether we like it or not we are not going to be able to afford to do 500,000 tests mm -hmm. the lab capacity is not there we have only two labs at the moment yeah. Yeah. in the sub region Nigeria is the one who's trying to school. they have five they're going to add two now the extra two they are adding is going to take three weeks mm -hmm. to develop for instance we know that we are adding I think two more labs mm -hmm. yeah. that they are still Probably working on in yeah. yes exactly so we are still trying to catch up with this we, we, we need to do this in a way that fits our circumstances and so far I think we're on the right path but moving to the lockdown area proper to test mm -hmm. that means all of us are getting tested is that the understanding of that no that especially is not. in the Accra Tema Kumasi if they say after the quarantine part after mm -hmm. the others uh, affected around that and now you want to move into the lockdown parts proper mm -hmm. can you um, clarify that to view okay. what now that listening means. to uh, the president's advisor, Dr. Anthony Siasari, who gave that particular explanation yesterday during the press briefing, he was very emphatic on what is going to happen. Now, the reason why they've done this one is to keep people where they are so that they can reach them. Now, whether to say that you can reach somebody might say, okay, but what if I decided to get on a bus and go to Kumasi? Mm -hmm. That will get us back to accurate information on That's contact right. tracing. Yeah. Yeah. So irrespective of whether you are in Accra, you move to Kumasi or Tamale, there's a lockdown in place. They will get to you and know that person A, B, but or C. But some moved already. Here. Exactly. But if the information is accurate, mm -hmm. you have a phone number. The person who gave the information knows where you are. Okay. So one way or the other, there is a, there's a 40 to 50 percent likelihood of finding you. Now, what is going to happen is that during the back tracing up to the 3rd of March, which includes a pool of about 30,000 people, that they are going to try and reach. They are going through flight manifest. They are going through immigration documents. Everybody who falls within that range, they are going to call you because anybody who comes through the country, obviously, you leave a phone number. There's a mm -hmm. contact line on mm -hmm. the immigration yeah, card. The card yeah. So th there's a first point of contact there. Mm -hmm. Now, once that is done, they say they will find you, whichever household you live in, everybody who lives in that household if it's even if it's a compound house and you occupy just one room in that compound house they are going to test everybody who lives in that compound house that is the upskill that they are doing according to dr Anthony. so the lockdown is not that they are going to test everybody in the lockdown areas but no based on the thirty thousand that they hope or, or they have put in uh, 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 in the bowl mm -hmm. that they are going to try and test anybody who comes within that scope at the moment irrespective of where you are if they come and they speak to you and they say okay this is uh, they come to house number eight gadgetsburg avenue and i live there 12 people in the house they are testing everybody irrespective of where they've been who they are okay. that is the plan for this one okay thank you yeah and and with the lockdown if you look at the figures and the resources available for example in the locked down area in greater Accra metropolitan um area Mm -hmm. We are looking at a total population of people within this area. Total population is about 4.7 million people. Mm -hmm. If we say we are going to test all these people, who is going to make those test kits? Are they even available in the market? Yeah. So they've um, deployed a structured way of um, um, prioritizing the tests. So people in mandatory quarantine, people who are known to have been in contact with them, and as Godfrey explained, the people who are closest to the issues when it comes to the contact tracing. Now, in the Ashanti region, the Greater Kumasi Metropolitan Area, mm -hmm. we are looking at 3.1 million people in the lockdown area. Mm -hmm. So, Greater Kumasi plus Greater Accra, we are looking at a total of 7.9 million people. Mm -hmm. It's not possible it's not to possible, test all these it? people. And that's yeah. about 26% of the national population. Okay. It's not possible to test these people. But the structured and the tiered nature of what, what is going to happen or what is happening is going to help us prioritize and optimize the resources we have, the, the, the facilities we have for testing, the test kits we have, and the human resource we have. 
And I'm sure that if we all adhere to this lockdown and do not go out and spread this, we can contain the situation gradually in the coming weeks and you'll see some positive news. Okay. So what we're seeing across um, some towns, not around the epicenters like Accra, uh, Kaswa, um, uh, Ashanti region, uh, Kumasi and all that, is people in certain areas now taking the law into their own hands and saying, hey, you're coming from Accra, Kumasi, don't come here. We're not sure what you have. So I'll take you guys to Saboba quickly, where the youth in the area, they decided to block the roads to that place, stopping people coming from the cities from coming there. Then we'll look at that. But uh, in a bit, we'll also look at day one of the partial lockdown in Accra, Kumasi, uh, and the other um, towns affected by that, and see what is happening, really. But let's go to Saboba first and see how the youth in the area are stopping people from coming there. All of us are powerless in one way or the other. We are unable to um, carry out what we are supposed to carry out to prevent this disease from entering Saboba. And so we are taking this decision as a people, collectively. And so it is neither here nor there. It is the youth that have organized and mobilized themselves to come here and to prevent people from entering because we suspect that some people might import these things to our district. And you know that our health system is deficient. We will not be able to take care of these serious issues. And so that is what we are doing. We are preventing them from coming to spend the market, at least for today and maybe the subsequent markets until we are all sure that the situation has died down and then we can now go about our normal duties. These are extraordinary times and so we are also feeling that we need to take some extraordinary measures in order to curb the spread of this disease because it is much more horizontal in spreading. And so that is what we are doing. So we have already sent messages to our people in Yendi and other places not to come to market today because they will not be allowed to enter Saloba. So those are some youth from uh, Saboba, obviously trying to <laughs> stop people from coming in. The movement thing, I mean, even today I met, I went on the streets, I met a couple of people who had come in from in, um, f the hinterlands, thinking they are moving away from that and coming into the city. And then some who are going into the hinterlands, feeling yeah. that it's better, you know, do, are we understanding this movement with regards to this virus thing? No, it's a universal phenomenon. and. The education can never be concrete enough on this because what motivates people to move goes beyond just hearing. Some of the persons who are moving are not people you would say can't read or write mm -hmm. or don't have any form of education, yeah. you know, both formal and informal. They understand what is going on. But the factors that urge one to move in such a circumstance goes beyond that. What people need to understand is under these circumstances, you do not take the law into your own hands, irrespective of the primal instinct that says that we must protect ourselves, which is what the young men of Saboba are sought to do by blocking the path and saying that you can't pass through because you might be passing through with COVID and whatnot. Yeah. Obviously, there's a certain level of, uh, there's a certain lack of information with regards to how the disease progresses and whatnot. But people need to calm down. People <laughs> need to understand that this is a country of laws. People need to understand that people have freedom of movement that cannot be curtailed by other citizens under certain circumstances. And that is why the police and the military went there and said, hey, let's do this, remove the virus. And it was a very peaceful thing, I must yeah, also say. Yeah. It did not degenerate into any yeah. kind of ruckus. Yeah. They did this um, in a very well-organized manner. Even though people were so stranded, at least they were able to resolve that particular issue. But what we need to understand is people should not get into the mentality where they feel they need to take the law into their own hands. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, once you start encouraging that, you get into a situation where somebody meets somebody and says, I think you are going to infect me and so, then yeah, I'm going to hit you it. or something just to protect themselves. And we've seen cases like that. If you recall, in Kenya, there was a case where a young man went to drink, was coming back and was lynched simply based on uh, the people thinking that, okay, this guy is behaving irrationally. He's coughing and spitting. He's coming to infect yeah. us. They lynched yeah. him. Yeah. And he was just drunk. Yeah. That was all that yeah. he had done wrong. Yeah. He, his only crime was being drunk. Mm -hmm. You know, so people need, we, 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 I think when we have an opportunity like this, we must educate people. People must calm down, be reasonable and rational in how you engage with other people. Dr. Coboy said something quite interesting. He said, you might feel that this person rather is the danger to you. And it's but not actually. It might not be the person. <laughs> Somebody else yeah. might be the danger yeah. to you. Yeah. And so let's all calm down and behave ourselves during this time okay and, and yeah. on this on this border issues and calming down mm. i think 
we also should not leave vacuums in certain places, right? We know that our borders are very porous. If you take our mainland borders, for example, Burkina Faso has about 222 confirmed cases. Mm -hmm. We share a very long stretch of border with them, about right. 350 kilometers. Yeah. And we know the official border crossings. But between the official border crossings, there are lots of unofficial border crossings, mm -hmm. right? And so we need to strategically use the intelligence we have to place key trained law enforcement officers mm -hmm. to patrol these unofficial border crossings. Because if we do not have trained people there, then the communities rise up on their own. And because they are not trained with the right protocols, it could also degenerate into something else. We share a border with Burkina to the north. Mm -hmm. We also share a border with Burkina to the west mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. northwest. Mm -hmm. And the black border separates us yeah. and Burkina. Yeah. And the yeah. same separates us and Cote d'Ivoire. And if you look at the data, Cote d'Ivoire has about 160 confirmed cases. So if we are strategic enough, we would put our armed forces and our trained security personnel at all these places. And the immigration has the intel on all these unapproved crossings so that we won't leave that work to untrained community members. Mm -hmm. That way, we are organizing the protection of our borders. If we don't do that, we'll put the communities in danger. Because look, if I'm a community person and somebody is coming, we don't know whether the person yeah. is negative or yeah. positive, yeah. and we want to drive them away, there is the likelihood of contact happening. Mm -hmm. but, but do we have the resource to do that? I'm just... Um, uh, remember the when we went to the heritage caravan, yeah. the Volta region, for example, the the border, you know, for uh, Volta and then Togo. Mm -hmm. I mean, in certain cases, just like uh, the, the street of Adabaka, Togo on your left, yeah. Ghana on your right, and the people move in and out. You know, one gets to get food here, the other gets, you know, some goods from there, and all these areas, all these open places. Can we man all that through it realistically? I, I, I think realistically we can do that. Um, there are some of the border towns which are such that no matter what you do, they still have to communicate. Yeah. Like the towns we, we saw in the Volta region, right? It's just a road that separates mm -hmm. them. But beyond the road, there's a stretch of land that divides Ghana and Togo proper. Okay. Even though geographically they are within Togo. You understand? Yeah. If you look at our um, security forces, we have about 25,000 policemen, okay, in the Ghana uh, police service. We have about 12,000 to 15,000 in the Ghana armed forces. We have immigration, we have fire service, and we have the others. If we are putting all these numbers together, mm -hmm. I want to assume that we could have a minimum of 30,000 armed and trained security forces available okay. who we can deploy strategically at some of these places to ensure we protect our borders and allow people from entering. Okay. If, if, if we do that and we put trained people there, we'll be reducing the risk that some of these communities face. Go to the north. So just to give mm -hmm. uh, viewers an idea of what is happening, so these are some ladies from Agbo mm -hmm. uh, these Kayaye and all these things. They're running away from Accra to the north. They were actually stopped at uh, Ejusu, you know, by the police, you know. <laughs> Comes back to what we're saying about the movements, quick yeah. movements, and you don't know who is moving with what and all that. But could you carry on? Yes, yeah, so, so as I was saying, when you go to the north, between the last town in Burkina Faso and the first town in Ghana, if I'm to mm -hmm. use that analogy. Yeah. You have a distance of just 20 to 30 kilometers separating these towns. So mm -hmm. it's technically like from walking from here to Ashalibotri or yeah. Adenta. Yeah. They are that close. Yeah. So we need our trained people there. Mm -hmm. Now on the movement of the Kaya to, to, to the north, mm -hmm. there's, there's an analogy that I believe in. It, babe, look, you baby are. Co baby. That's <laughs> what we say in Pew, right? And mm -hmm. Amati has a song like that. If you are in the urban areas and you are poor in the urban areas, you feel the pinch more than being poor in your own village. Because mm -hmm. yeah. at least there is a social structure that will give you a bit of a respite. Yeah. So if you are in your village, you are likely to have a room to sleep in. Mm -hmm. You are likely to get some water or some food to sure. eat somehow. Sure. But sure. if you are in the city sure. and you don't have a place to, to sleep, you are likely to sleep pavements in front of shops in kiosks and at these particular times mm -hmm. those are not the places you want people to sleep yeah. number two when it comes to getting access to the to the basics that people need when you're in, the, in your village you you are rest assured that people may share food and the basic things if you're here in the city and there should be any shortage it may be very difficult for you 
to, to, to get what you need. So I wasn't surprised to see them going back home in their numbers because it's safer for them there than in the cities. But yeah. these people, I mean, if, if we go by what is happening, um, the numbers we've seen testing positive and then the contacts they've made, there's a possibility that people have been to markets and all these areas yeah. and probably infected one or two people. At the same time, we're seeing people from the cities, all these crowded places, moving outside. What strategy do we have to track all these people in case they ha may have picked something along the line? That's a difficult <laughs> question, but <laughs> it's also... A plausible risk. Yeah. You know, the situation you, you've just painted is one that could happen. You know, I, I, in situations like this, you might have to take your chance on these things. Because if you also look at the data, a lot of the quick increases, in the rapid increases in country cases have come because of clusters mm -hmm. where people have met. So, for instance, you had the cases going down in Korea, then suddenly went up again because some people decided to go and meet somewhere in Daegu. In France, you had the same thing. In Italy, you had the same thing. In Spain, you had the same thing. In the US, New Orleans at the moment, there was a point they had just 25 cases. Yeah. Then they decided to organize Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. where 50,000 people yeah. were standing in yeah. one street. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Within yeah. two weeks, they are so catching up to New that. York. Yeah. Their numbers are going up. So there's always a, a danger of you getting cluster cases and a community spread, especially mm -hmm. when you have these kinds of movements but like i said again you can't help it because you can't have a situation where you say don't move if you say don't move people will still move irrespective mm -hmm. so there are those who who have uh, made the argument that the president shouldn't have given a two-day leeway there is no you see the way this outbreak is mm -hmm. vivian there is no perfect scenario mm -hmm. for this now i'll give you a typical example india organized an immediate shutdown look at that what look at the chaos yeah that ensued over the weekend, where you had millions of people simply trying to go home because they couldn't find rice to eat. Oh, yeah. This is the country with the largest population of day laborers in the world. They couldn't find food. And like Ujo was saying, when it becomes a matter of survival, how are you going to tell people that stay, don't stay don't here move. or don't do that? Okay, so it's a risk that comes with the situation. There is no perfect formula for handling this. What must be done is what perhaps we have heard announced the announcement of certain areas uh, in some of these in, in other parts of the countries that will also have testing capacity mm -hmm. and for me that was interesting i i saw a video i think it was in chirapa for instance where they set up a control center as soon as buses arrive they get you off the bus they take you to a place they sensitize you on what to do they take your temperature and then they take your contacts as well I am hoping that situation is one that will be replicated across the country mm -hmm. so that one way or the other we will still have ways of reaching these people because at least one will have a phone and my know and in those areas they are quite they are easier to trace than in accra That's because right. these are communal areas everybody yeah. knows everybody mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so it, it, it's a plausible risk but we must also understand vivian there is no perfect scenario countries are making this up as they go by day by day by day and you might realize that a strategy might work in country A today. You adopt it, and then that strategy yeah. fall, uh, fails in, in that country. country yeah. But it even fails in that country that you've adopted it from. <laughs> and then you ask yourself, because okay. You know, just a, a few days ago, everybody was praising India. <laughs> yes. That they were doing a terrific I, I, job. I, I was right? going to mention that, and God <laughs> said yeah. it uh, very well. There is no perfect yeah. strategy for this. Because India spent some time to plan. They banned exports. They made sure they were stocking strategic stuff they will mm -hmm, need so mm -hmm. their reserves will be good yeah right even that see what 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 they are dealing with now let's look at lockdown scenarios in places like jordan mm -hmm. they locked down jordan <laughs> in days people were yeah. angry people yeah. wanted to just but there was the no and they took it off. um you look at other places <laughs> well organized communities locked down but people still struggle right and when the conversation about lockdown in ghana came up people were like how are we going to do this to survive Mm -hmm. because Ghana we are in a state of planlessness yeah. we are this we don't have this we don't have this one of the things that I thought would make us survive is our state of planlessness because we've always said that look we have too many shops look look at Adabraka right behind mm -hmm. you in the glass every 10 meters you see a corner shop selling something 
all around our communities. Every 10 meters, you see a corner shop. So per the analysis, you see that we have shops distributed all across the country where at least when people need basics, they can get something. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, you'd have to travel, say, a five kilometers, 10 kilometers to go to the big mall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if movement is restricted, sort of, and you don't have these corner shops and all, the, all this planlessness around you, it puts you in a dire situation. Yeah. So you cannot copy and paste somebody's strategy for your country. Ghana is different. The US is different. India is different. One thing that um, I was happy about was to listen to the Minister of Agri about the arrangements being made for food. And I, and, and I want to assume also that they've done a calculation of the strategy stocks we need mm -hmm. for basic things, like rice. If you look at our annual consumption, we consume, say, this amount of bags, right? The last time we did the calculation, we consume about 16 million uh, bags of the 5 kg bags in a month in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So can we call all the rice distributors and check the stocks that they have? Yeah. Can we check the paddy up in the north and the water and ask if we are to mail these, would it meet the numbers we may need? Should this comp uh, um, um, situation continue? Sugar, what mm -hmm. stocks do we have? Yeah. And the other things. For vegetables and tomatoes, we know that they have a shorter um, 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 maturity time. There are some vegetables you can grow, and in two, three weeks, four weeks, you have something you are going to, going to eat. But the things that we do not have control over, we should take our strategic stocks and see how, if our stocks are not enough, we can add on. Okay. That way we know that we are making a headway. But the most important thing that people should know is that there is no <coughs> perfect way of dealing with this with any strategy. The, the best way for you to help deal with this is to stay at home. Yeah. Okay. Stop the spread. Stay at home. Stop the spread. Make sure you go according to the protocols. That's the surest way we can all help to deal with this. COVID-19 situation. Okay, so partial lockdown in motion. Day one, your assessment. Well... Now we'll come to the uh, details. So just I, a general I, assessment. I, I, I would give it a 60%. Okay. In my estimation, I think there was still too much movement. Okay. You know, people... There, there was... So this is, uh, I believe, circle. Yes. This, I, I went to this place earlier. Uh, pretty um, dead, a bit. Yes. Like, yeah, but when I was coming to work from my house, from Teshin Gwai Estates to uh, City FM, there was a lot of movement. Exactly. From the, my side. From your but side. Circle and, was dead. And like, okay, I, so I got reports from Spintex as well. Yeah. There was quite a lot of movement as well. And in other parts of the country, if um, you, you, uh, I got a video from Umar Usanda on the main stretch that leads out of Accra yeah. into the Volta region, yes, for instance. Sutrari, the Sutrari yeah. Jackson barrier. Yeah. There was a lot of traffic on <laughs> that road, you know. But like I said, I gave it sixty percent because there were a lot of what I call curiosity seekers mm -hmm. as well on the road. People who just wanted to have a feel, and it's so not they are not really under essential, but they just they want to people wanted to just have a feel. What was called the or what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and that is those we are advising that look. It's important to stay home, yeah. but th there's also a nature of man where he wants to experience something that he hasn't experienced before and feels that he cannot experience that whilst he's out. Mm -hmm. So I must go out there. And I listened to an audio, for instance, this afternoon of a guy who was asked, why are you out? He was like, oh, I wanted to see. I wanted to get yeah. a feel. And they're like, what why do you want to get you, a feel yeah. of? I was like, yeah, I want to see whether I can do, I can walk. <laughs> so he went out and walked. Mm. You understand? So we, over a period of time, we will get used to staying at home. We will get used to not being allowed to do the things that we normally do. For now, it's the first day. We, our parents might take this easier than we will because yeah. our parents are used to such situations. Mm -hmm. We are used to doing what we want to do. And so you will have clusters of resistance, yeah. not f in a violent manner, but si people simply testing the boundaries of the law. Mm -hmm. And we've seen videos of some, some of them paying oh, for yes, it in all, <laughs> in all kinds of ways. But it can be better, in yeah. my estimation. We need to take this seriously. Okay. The, the, the persons out there who simply want to step out of their homes because they feel, okay, let me see what this is about, if you don't have business being out there. And I, I listened to the conversation Bernard Avler had yesterday with, uh, on this same program where he made a kusha where people seem to be offended that they are not on the oh, exempted yeah, list of, you know. in essential services. You should not be offended that you are not on it. Should you should be happy. You see, because the essential services are the ones who are out there. Yeah. Imagine journalists going into hospitals, mm -hmm. 
simply to tell you at home, in the comfort of your what home, is what is happening, how many cases are there. That journalist could also be home. Yes. But that journalist is considered essential service. If I bring you from your house and say, okay, you go to Ridge mm. and go and report mm. on COVID, you mm. say, hey, so, hey, I don't hey, want hey, to go. My friend. <laughs> but at the same time, you are yeah. home upset that you are not part of the essential mm. services. So I think people should consider themselves privileged, okay, that they have been moved to a situation where they don't have to expose themselves to the dangers that could probably give mm -hmm. you this disease and stay home. I'm expecting that, Vivian, by okay. the end of the week, our behaviors will improve. For a first day, like I said, it's a satisfactory mm -hmm. uh, outcome. See? Hopefully, we can get to an excellent outcome. Okay, could you assess me? I, I don't know whether I can give um, a rating now, <laughs> but <laughs> the <laughs> distance I covered this morning to work was quite short. And I noticed that traffic was almost like at a zero percent okay. because it's one of the hottest routes in this city, mm. from the police headquarters all the way to Circle okay. to Adabraka, and the, and the and the traffic was okay. really minimal. So that's uh, tiptoe lane, very yeah. busy area yeah, yeah, when yeah. it's you know not this. Yes, but look at that. Very in the morning, <laughs> in the morning, I counted just about three people around that area mm -hmm. when I was driving on the overpass, yeah. right and. I've been monitoring the Google Live traffic, the traffic map, right? Mm -hmm. And the places I'm seeing a bit of traffic and movement, like in Accra, you see the motorway, mm -hmm. the Accra tow boot side. You see a bit mm -hmm. of a, an orange and a red because people are still using the motorway and they have to pay their tolls. Okay. If you check the various checkpoints, if you are going to a bridge, are you mensa? Mm -hmm. You see an orange, meaning there are vehicles there either paying tolls or b vehicles being denied movements into Ebri, you check the Dawenya area and there's a bit of traffic. That's also a checkpoint, right? Mm -hmm. You go to the Kaswa side, the Kaswa toll booth, you see the traffic. But on the main arteries and the main roads in the city, you mm -hmm. see all green. Yeah. And, and, and at this particular point, on any regular day, the least you should see is light orange. Mm -hmm. But now we are seeing all green. Okay. Meaning that from this data that I'm seeing, because we don't have to go out much, right? Yeah. It means that generally people have not gone out. Generally, movement has been limited. But the few cases of people trying to be dead devils, or what you try to say in Shishu <laughs> Nimu, in, in another way, trying to show that they are also men, so they want yeah. to go out to feel the situation. Okay. That doesn't protect anybody. Okay. And we've also seen, we, we've not heard reports of police or the military brutalizing people. Like some people feared uh, prior to this. So for me, I think it's been good. It could get better. All the people running around not having any essential thing to do should go back home and they should remain there in the interest of the public. Okay, let me take you guys to Kaswa on enforcement okay. and, and the movement. And uh, we have a video of some 16 persons who were arrested at Kaswa. They had no business in town. They decided to come into town. Let's see how the Joint Police and Military Tax Force addressed that situation. <laughs> yes. But you see a uh, uh, electrician. Yeah. But uh, yesterday even we your master talks to make you close. We talk and say, okay, we are here, but he say make it come Kaswa come take our clothes and go. That's why we come take the clothes and go. Why you come take us uh, make it come stay here. Uh, why am I afraid? Because I know me some before. This is my first time. So we read the road top and where uh, some one soldier be drop us say where we go where, where we explain give them. So we explain give them and where, uh, where they talk us like make you no go. So we 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 get a second from the Kumasi where we come here. So we want to take a second go when I village there. So make you no go may come here. Our grandmother sent us to go and buy credit, and the time we are on the way come and they arrested us. Are you not aware that there's a lockdown and people no, are not no, no. go out? Yes. You are not aware? Yes, but I don't know that this place is part. Because yesterday some people came around and they spray here. So I wasn't aware that they, they would come today too. We told them that ground that says going by credit. He said, that why, are we, why are the two of us are going to buy the credit? He said, I should come and sit here. So are, are you worried that you have been detained? Yes. Uh, have you informed? Uh, have you been able to call your grandmother and inform her? No. no. Yes. Now you are on the way going, but we wasn't aware that they are here. 
and we are just trying to get some of the credit because he needs it now and we are not aware that he's here that's why so that's somebody doing you know into a wine no <laughs> yeah. you know, so these you know people are just flouting the the, the rules i i don't know the, the let, let, let me let me just things. read something for you before kojo comes <laughs> this i've already discussed this now afro barometer um today just about 20 minutes ago released a finding mm -hmm. based on some work that they had done mm -hmm. and it says that Ghana's acceptance of security related restrictions faces test mm -hmm. with COVID-19 lockdown now if you look at the key findings it says that uh, in the late 2019 three quarters of Ghanaians said the government should be able to curtail uh, people's movement in the face of threats to security the willingness to accept government restrictions on movement was lower in greater Accra, which was 64 <laughs> percent than in the Ashanti region which yeah. was at 79 percent and if you look at the report that we've had today it will confirm these findings we haven't had too many incidents yeah. in Kumasi mm -hmm. we've had quite a few arrests and people misbehaving yeah. in Accra they also said that a lockdown may pose particular challenges for Ghanaians experiencing uh, lift poverty and that had to do with you know situations that We've already discussed with, uh, especially with work, uh, the situation that Kujo described. Uh, also, essential services, access to water, and whatnot. And today, we've had a lot of complaints yeah. about water. People in Pram Pram, especially, have been sending messages all day. And electricity yeah. reach out yeah. you know, as yeah. well. Digitally. So yeah. that is what will push people to, re to, to find it hard mm -hmm. to accept a lockdown. Not because it's no good for them, but simply because they feel that they have more essential things and mm -hmm. what is considered essential is relative you understand yeah what the government might consider non-essential for that boy's grandmother yes the credit it. at that moment was the most essential, essential thing in her yes. life yes, yes. so <laughs> but, but the credit we should uh, people, people should be allowed to sell credit how do they communicate or if you have mobile money you recharge your account and you can buy credit using your mobile money yeah we yes. should um, we should teach people to do yeah. that but but the afrobarometer um, um report Before. that godfrey just read it's interesting so whereas people in kumasi will be more cooperative when it comes mm -hmm. to security related mm -hmm. restrictions mm -hmm. is that I'm what you're look, saying i'm looking at the google um live traffic. traffic map and i'm seeing more traffic hotspots within the greater kumasi metropolitan area compared to what i'm seeing in the greater Accra metropolitan mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. for example if you go to certain parts of the cbd you see pure red mm. indicating that there, there there are traffic jams and there's um movement is not m going on very well right if you go to the asafu area mm -hmm. where the mosque is you see an orange showing that there are vehicles on the move mm -hmm. so comparatively even though they are more supportive of security related restrictions based on the afrobarometer what the live map is telling me is that people in accra are moving there's less movement in accra compared to movement within the greater Kumasi metropolitan area which is a very very interesting thing mm -hmm. we are seeing mm -hmm. with the data but all in all people should know that staying at home is to protect them and this i'll continue to say okay. staying at home is to protect them okay. and the essentials they need number one is your life without your life the food you are going to chase the clothes you want to buy at this time when you don't have a wedding a funeral work to go church to go are you going honest, to wear it too? all those things <laughs> are just okay, wants they are not needs so let's find our need water okay great you have electricity great there's security because there are police and armed forces um, deployed in all our communities right okay. and, the, and the few things food mm -hmm. going out at this time also puts the security agencies at risk because if you have it sometimes some people try to resist mm. and force may be applied and in the application of the force there will be contact that is somebody's child you are putting at risk yeah. so if you don't have any business going out stay at home so let's stay, uh, stay with the essential services mm -hmm. and we went to Koligono to see how they, they, they are dealing with essential services for example public toilets and all that which mm. you see large crowds of them and they have to share that but how did they go about that let's let's have the video from Koligona I think Caleb Kuda filed a report and see how it went over there 
In Ghana, the facilities are few. Mm. It's not like the Europe one. When they tell you there's a lockdown, all of them will stay at home because they have got their apartments and all sort of things. Mm. But here, the public toilet, <laughs> you have to use the public toilet. Mm. So, early in the morning like that, people come to toilet a lot, so mm. they have to come. That's why I've seen them here. Okay. So you've been there? Yeah. yeah okay. Been. How essential is it for us to open public toilets during the lockdown? Very essential because after for toilet you cannot <laughs> you cannot do anything with uh, going to toilets. I'm into a public a to the jinx. I went to the jinx. The public toilet. Okay. What do you uh, what do you think about the lockdown? It's good. It's good. It's good. To protect all of us. Mm. It's a good idea. Okay. What do you think about some of the essential services that have been allowed? You know, to oh, open, it's also good. Like the public toilet. Yes, it's also good. Mm. If it wasn't open, how would they have affected you? Because there's no <laughs> in my house. Mm. There's no in my house. There's no public toilet. <laughs> oh. I advise uh, the people to take care of themselves. Wash their hands and then try to be clean always. Right. So there's a lock, partial lockdown, but you're able to use the public toilet. How good is that for you? Oh, not all that good, but we manage. Anytime I visit the toilet, I wash my hands. So that's a colleague going on sharing um, um, this, that public toilet over there uh, falling within the essential services and, yeah. you know, what, 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 what it is and what it is, mm -hmm. what it is. But let me take you guys quickly to the judiciary. You know, they are part of the people that are exempted. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a statement um, given clear details of how that arm, of gap, um, arm should go around their business. So... Um, it says, in implementing His Excellency's directives, the following steps have been taken by the judiciary to ensure that the critical services rendered by this arm of government is made available during this period um, as the exigencies of the situation demand. So it says, one, the restrictions imposed on the citizenry of Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi affect all lawyers and litigants and or other court users since these categories of persons were not exempted. Two, for this reason, registrars uh, are directed to adjourn all cases listed during this period to dates in May and June 2020. In Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi, the courts listed in Schedule A and B, I'll give you them soon, are designated to deal with critical cases which may arise. For example, breaches arising from the restriction orders and other criminal matters. The Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal are available to handle urgent cases as may be determined by the Chief Justice during this period. Registries of the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal will be open during this period. Now, support staff who fall in certain categories have already been requested to take their annual leave. The following skeletal staff will, however, be required to be in place to support the designated court. So we have the registrars, the cashiers, court clerks, interpreters, recorders, and bailiffs. All other staff will be required to apply for their leave during the period of the restriction. Administrative officers will be manned, officers will be manned by skeletal staff determined by heads of departments to ensure that critical services are rendered during this period. Earlier press releases issued by the judiciary on the 10th and 20th March of this year, which outline COVID-19 protocols still apply. Once again, the cooperation of the general public will be greatly appreciated. Um, so this is coming from the judiciary. People were asking uh, whether the lawyers uh, mm. are allowed to go out and mm -hmm. all that. They are saying that lawyers and litigants, please go and stay somewhere. Unless it has to do with Supreme Court and Appeal Court, and that should even be determined by the, uh, um, the, the Chief Justice and all that. Interesting with, with these movements. Right? Yeah, and support staff... Uh, who fall in certain categories also requested to take their annual leave mm -hmm. and those who are in place again just to reiterate what you said registrars cashiers court clerks interpreters uh, recorders and bailiffs so this is the uh, skeletal stuff 
so this is what is going to happen at the courts. Well, I, I COVID strikes again. Co considering <laughs> the fact that we are deploying our security agencies mm -hmm. to um, ensure that the lockdown is successful, I think this is um, in the right direction. Okay. Because we know that in certain instances, there are certain cases that require prosecutors, mm -hmm. right? And I want to assume that a lot of these prosecutors and the people in the police service may be co-opted into busy. the lockdown enforcement team. So we may not have enough people. Okay. And the direction also to judges to um, adjourn cases to latter days Major. also makes it really um, functional for the judicial system at least. You don't have pending cases because judges have been instructed to adjourn cases to a latter date. So mm -hmm. this really works and I, I, I pray that the learned men and women in the profession will also stick to this because we need everybody at home. Okay, right. So another issue that is big with regards to um, commercial vehicles is the cost, the, the fares, whether we see hikes, uh, reductions, whether we see government giving them waivers and all that. But Kojo Ajiman went to town to see okay. what the situation is proper. Are they, have they increased the fares? Is government giving them any form of, uh, you know, waiver to absorb what the, 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 the numbers will see in reducing the, the numbers in the trotters, etc. So let's take that video from Kojo and then we'll deal with that one here. This is the Circle Main Station. This station used to be a vibrant one and a busy one, of course. But because of the COVID-19 lockdown, this station um, is not too busy as we have observed over the years. I've seen passengers boarding uh, the urban buses, the commercial urban buses, others also coming out of the buses. Let me get close to them and ask them how they are observing the social distancing rule at the station on the bus and also how the drivers are treating the whole lockdown issue. Let me get close to some of them and then talk to them. This is Mercedes-Benz bus, so it loads from Circle to Bubuas. Let me get close inside. I've seen that um, four passengers are in, one at the front seat, and then you see three inside. Let me get close to them and ask them what is the seating arrangement from wherever they were coming from. I was coming from Taifa, mm. and the sitting arrangement was 2-2. But right now, I'm, I'm getting to uh, Bubuashi, and it was 3-3. Mm. Mm. So it means that the drivers are observing the social distancing rule in the Trotros? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about this whole restriction? Oh, I'm okay. This uh, master bus is also loading from Circle to uh, Mampro B Banana Inn. Uh, let me talk to one gentleman who is at the front seat. So what is the sitting arrangement like? Okay, it's not so bad. As I came, I was seeing that there is no more plenty people in town. So as we are sitting one by one in each car, I thought if this thing pass out when you sit in the car territory, it will be better for us. Now, either two drivers here were loading their cars to full capacity, so if it's an Evan bus, one seat will take three passengers. If it's a Benz bus, um, one seat will take four passengers. But that is not the case. They are, I mean, loading, they are loading um, two for an Evan bus and then three for an a Mercedes-Benz bus. Let me talk to some of the owners of um, the cars here, or some of the station masters here, who will tell us the arrangement they've had with government. I think the education is from you, the media. You have already put up, uh Okay, so Kojo, interesting, right? Yes, very interesting. Um, so the lady said she picked the church off from a certain point. It was 2-2, two, two, mm -hmm. and they got to a certain point, and it was 3-3. Three, three. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, um, monitoring these church and ensuring that we enforce the laws with them will take extra manpower. Okay. So if you remember very well, sometime last year, 
we did an analysis of urban transport mm -hmm. within Accra using Ayalolo mm -hmm. as reference. And we argue that we have 247 buses bought for Ayalolo, and only 18, um, each of them has a capacity to take about 80 people, right? Now, at this particular point, when, at that point when we did the analysis, we, we, we realized that Ayalolo could transport 2.6 million passengers every month in this city, mm -hmm. if you are doing the contract flow analysis. Okay. Now, Ayalolo is something that we can monitor and ensure compliance to um, social distancing. Mm -hmm. So I thought that we would deploy these buses in Kumasi and in Accra. Give Accra 140, give Kumasi 100. Mm -hmm. If you look at what is happening within the system right now, and you're even going to divide the 86,000 a day passengers mm -hmm. in Accra by three so that we enforce social distancing. Yeah. We could be doing close to 30,000 passengers in a day, okay. which would give the healthcare workers and the various people, the essential, the people performing essential services, the, the, the assurance that at least even when it comes to transportation, there's a safer option. I'm not seeing that, and I really believe that that's one of the best options we can have. Put our Lolo on our streets, let them work, let them ensure social distancing, let them go around the clock, because we are now looking at a reduced population. I'm, I'm not sure that the people who will be in the essential services group within this city is up to 50,000 people, okay. just about 20, 15,000, 20 people thereabout. So these things can really help us to do with that. If we leave it to the church or operators, they'll do whatever suits them. And mm. we've seen that all, all around us. Even seat belts, we've been trying to force them to have seat belts and show basic safety mechanisms in their buses. They are not doing that. And for me, this is an opportunity for us to put our buses on the streets. Metro mass, if we are not doing intercity, we could co opt some of their buses to do intracity so that we protect people who have to be on the move and not leave them at the mercy of these structural drivers who do things at, at, at their own okay. um, 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 will. Okay. So a lot of questions coming, a lot yeah. of reactions from um, our viewers and all. <laughs> yeah. I think we should get um, yeah. dedicate Let the rest me. of the time quickly. Let me start with this one. She, he, or he, that's Derek. He says his car broke down in the middle of the road on his way to work. He was told he can't get it fixed because Abuso kind spare parts dealers aren't working. And he's asking why they should be exempted if the trotro are still uh, working. <laughs> why it shouldn't be under essential services. <laughs> okay. This one says... Um, okay. These are all praises to you. <laughs> okay. This one says, um, I run a veterinary pharmacy. Can I work? Well, it depends on where the veterinary is. Mm -hmm. That will be the big question. So if you can tell us where he lives. Because okay. if it's within his community, it might be okay. But if he has to move from where, then it means he's going to work because that is his actual job. Mm -hmm. And per the listing we have, it is not essential. And you see, that's what I said when it comes to what is considered essential. Mm -hmm. If everybody is allowed to have his definition, his or her definition mm -hmm. of what everybody it says, will to, everybody will go yeah. to that. Maybe Godfrey, on this, we may need clarification from the ministry is because my understanding of the work of uh, a, vet. A, a vet is, is, is a bit more essential. That's my understanding. Yeah. For example, if, if mm -hmm. I have a poultry farm and food producers must be working mm -hmm. and I need essential medicine now and we mm -hmm. won't let vets work and I don't have stock, mm -hmm. how do I then deal with that particular issue? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> maybe we may need clarification from the ministries responsible for that. If um, you have dogs at home and there is any, anything which you need to deal with immediately. So I don't know. I, okay, it, so I feel knowing the work of vets and in our food chain, the role they can play, maybe mm -hmm. they may be essential or not, but the ministry people should really set the record straight on this. Okay. This one says, can all food vendors be tested before they are allowed to operate? Imagine the mass that will be infected by just one infected food vendor. I think I explained the uh, rationale behind the, proto uh, the testing protocol that um, is in place at the moment. You have to show a certain level of symptom mm -hmm. for them to move into testing or you should have been named as part of the contact tracing to be tested because other than that you are talking about random testing mm -hmm. which is going to take away and what we see what people must understand and i know people are agitated by this mm -hmm. 
being tested doesn't mean you won't get corona. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you'll be tested every other every, week. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? You'll be tested every other week. That is not how it works. But I can also understand the agitation of people who feel that just test us, test us, test us. But there's a limit to the resources that are available when it comes to this. Yeah. The testing capacity, the persons who even do the testing, we have a limit to that okay. as well. So people should also okay. understand. This one says he's around here with us. He has a, a poultry farm here at Adabraka, but he stays at Kolebu. How do I show, uh, what identity <laughs> must I show to the security personnel for them to allow me to go and check on my animals? A lesson on formalization of businesses. You run a poultry farm. Mm -hmm. This should be a lesson, a prompt that beyond the COVID-19 crisis, you should register your poultry farm, whether it's small scale, medium scale. <laughs> you should no, you should register some form of business and try to formalize, have IDs. And you know, you never know when you need some of these things mm -hmm. because you live at Kolebu, your farm is at Adabraka. If you cannot move and poultry needs attention, yeah. that means you are yes. losing your best. Close care. If you are yeah. not losing, we are, we are also losing our food. Mm -hmm. So find a way of explaining to the, um, the security, the security personnel. personnel. Today we've had people move from different parts of the city. Essential people move from different parts of the city to other parts where they were not stopped because there were no roadblocks. This lockdown feels, it looks flexible. Mm. Yes. So, and, and, and I know that the security services, they've been trained to listen. Okay. So explain and then You'll get on with get your business. But beyond that, Try to formalize things a bit. Okay. Okay, guys, there are a lot of questions from you. Uh, our time okay. is up. We can't take over. We'll try to uh, reply them via the medium you send them. But thank you very much, Godfrey Akoto Bwati. Pleasure. And, um, Kojo oh. Akoto Wait. She actually is there properly. <laughs> <laughs> I accept it. If you don't mention his name properly, we will test you. Akoto Bwati. That's that. No wonder we are going to test. So it is Godfrey Akoto Bwati. <laughs> so, girlfriend, always a pleasure. Waffle yes. and uh, what's your name again? <laughs> okay, I could do what? Akoto Bwati. Sign yourselves out. Sign yourselves out. My name is David Kai Loko. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again tomorrow. But uh, keep your dial on the City 97.3 FM as well as City TV every uh, uh, second will give you up updates on the COVID-19. And if you can do the radio or TV, go to citynewsroom.com. We've got everything there. Thank you so much. Goodbye.